Welcome to Film with 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm very excited to welcome Daniel Howitt to the podcast today to talk about the life and times of Judge Roy Bean, starring the one and only Paul Newman. How are we doing, Daniel? I am so good. Excited to talk about a movie I had never seen before, before today, or before I watched it me, for this podcast. Me neither. Yeah. Okay, nice, nice. Well, at least once a month for the podcast, I like to re review a movie I haven't seen. And part of the reason I do this is that in the early 70s, there's so many films, many of which have big stars in the lead that I've never seen. Some I'd never heard of. I had never heard of this movie until a few weeks ago. Had you heard of this one? No, I hadn't. No, this is <laughs> when you when you asked me to be on, I was like, what is this movie? And I see Paul Newman, John Houston. I was like, wow, OK. All right. Yeah, let's check it out. I feel like if a movie comes along that stars Paul Newman in the lead role and is directed by John Houston, we have to do an episode about it. <laughs> right, exactly. But weirdly, I mean, I'm sure we'll we'll talk more about this, but weirdly, no like cultural footprint for this movie. Like you you and I both, you know, obviously film film fans, film yeah. history fans, and yeah, never heard of it. It's so weird. It's like if the movie doesn't get a lot of Oscar nominations, if it doesn't do well at the box office, even in the early 70s, it can kind of disappear yeah. over many decades, even when it has a huge star like this one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to see that it was on HBO, HBO Max, though. That you was know, a lovely discovery. <laughs> yeah, that's the beautiful thing about HBO Max that I hope doesn't change with all the insanity is they really do have a great film library on there of, of like a lot of classic films. I mean, tons that they could add but like yeah some random films like this that you yeah. can just discover it's been sad the last six months i would say for the podcast so many 1972 films we've looked at that are unavailable like really? almost everywhere where you have to like really dig into the the dark web to find a copy <laughs> like to watch it wow. there was even one we i couldn't do an episode for that i like i really? just could not find like anywhere to watch it so what was the it, movie it was uh, Milos Forman's debut called Taking Off. Okay, wow. And Milos Forman, a very yeah. you know important director who would go on to make One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus, and he doesn't have a lot of credits. And he made yeah. a movie that Roger Ebert gave four stars to. Hmm. And it has lots of great reviews and could not find it. <laughs> wow. Could could you rent it? Like No! Wow. Couldn't, could, I could, couldn't. Like, like, the last... Like if, if I have to pay to rent it, I will. But sure. there wasn't even that option. Wow. So that wow. was weird. And so my guests and I had to just pick a different movie because I was like, I'm sorry, I can't find it. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so when it's on HBO Max or it's available even on Amazon Prime or just it's it's readily available. I can just watch it easily. <laughs> I don't have yeah. to like go searching for it. Uh, I feel like this movie, I was surprised that it was on HBO Max. You feel, you've, it seems like this one would have been one of the harder ones to find. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As you used to, you told me right away that it was available on HBO Max. I was like, great. Awesome. That's uh, I'm, I'm shocked. I don't know how I haven't seen this movie before. Yeah. They have a great classic film library, at least as yeah. of this recording. As of now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, what, sometimes it'll just suggest titles underneath and I'm like, oh, I want to watch that too. You know, yeah, <laughs> find a reason. Yeah. I but, really uh, hope that the new uh, what's his name? David uh, Sasilov. Is that his name? Uh, the, the president of Warner Brothers Discovery. I hope they at least I know they're doing all, all this tax write off stuff. Yeah. Yada, yada. I like just this is why people love warner brothers really mm. is the, it's it's they're one of the classic studios and it's right now hbo max has this unique ability to have just so many more classic films mm -hmm. in the library than netflix i mean netflix has nothing uh in terms of classic film and so yeah. like come on like this that's a selling point of hbo max <laughs> like that's profitability i feel like so i I don't know. I mean, what what the heck do I know? I know nothing about business, but still, come on, keep these, yeah, keep these movies on there. I'm curious how it works because I can't imagine they have every classic Warner Brothers movie on there. No, so who not. makes the choice that the life and times of Judge Roy <laughs> Bean makes the list? Yeah, somebody, <laughs> some some uh, VP at Warner Brothers signed some contract. Okay, we can let Roy Bean be on here. Sure. Yeah. You, was that was that a day where someone was like, "Hey guys, guys, I just you don't have Judge Roy Bean. That's a classic. We need to put that on. Track the it service. down. 
track it down let's some, go some young guy and like you know one of the interns is like look okay how do i find this movie what is this movie <laughs> paul who is this who a is comedy this? <laughs> it looks like a western but it's directed by john houston it can't be that funny hmm. <laughs> you're describing wait a second you're describing my exact process of watching this film hold on <laughs> yeah that that was kind of exciting too when i put this on the other night i was like i don't even know what genre this is like the, yeah. the i looked at the, a couple images and i thought oh this is a western yep and it's going to be a serious western but it's not yeah. like it has That's, serious yeah. moments that is right? exactly my process so i watched it yesterday morning okay and uh, yeah, I, I looked up nothing about it other than, you know, the cast and all that. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch any trailers or anything like that. Um, don't know if a trailer exists for this movie, but um, <laughs> I'm sure there's a, uh, one out there. Right? <laughs> but it um, yeah, as soon as the as soon as like the bear started showing up, <laughs> I was like, hold on. What what movie is this? Is this a comedy? And then, yeah, I, I it, it slowly started to dawn on me. Like I was like, oh, that's a funny moment. That's a funny moment. Wait, is this a comedy? Is this okay? I guess that's what we're doing. Yeah. So John Houston himself appears in the movie mm -hmm. and he drops off this bear to <laughs> Roy Bean. And then we have like a long, like lovey dovey segment, like straight out of Butch casting the Sundance Kid, raindrops are falling <laughs> on my head of, of, uh, of of Paul Newman and his kind of his love interest, uh, you know, playing around with the bear and in puddles and rivers, Put, and pushing like, on a swing, going <laughs> going for a swing, like just with like... this huge grin on his face, pushing this giant black bear back and forth as the uh, Oscar nominated song plays yeah, over, right? Yeah, and I'm like, what what is happening? <laughs> and you know what I you know what I have to say, Brian? It was working for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was working for me. I was, I was like, you know what? This is, this is ridiculous, and I'm kind of into it. <laughs> it was all right. Oh yeah. So yeah, let's, yeah, let's just say right off the top. I, I didn't know what to expect from this. I do think it's flawed, and it's got some weird issues towards the end where we have a time jump, and that mm -hmm. took me out a little bit. But I would say for the most part, I very much enjoyed this movie. This was a lovely surprise. Yeah, it's, it's. <laughs> yeah, I was so surprised because same thing. You know, I, I was expecting dramatic thing and so as soon as the jokes started rolling i was like okay this is a comedy all right i'm into it and it wasn't until we were maybe a third of the way through the movie when i started realizing okay this is episodic this is not Very i kept every every <laughs> time a new character was introduced i was like okay this is the plot of the movie yeah. you know okay hey this one you know the, the priest or whatever is shows up okay he's gonna be a main character uh what, what's his name bad bob shows up he's the main villain no uh, so the episodic nature of it did take me out a little bit. That didn't take me mm -hmm. out, but it, it, it prevented me from getting as invested as I th think I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Um, but the comedy was surprisingly still working really well <laughs> for me. Uh, that I was like, once I realized what it was, realized that this was just an episodic little thing. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's when I was accepted it and, and yeah, it worked for me. I feel like the episodic nature of the movie probably prevented it from being a bigger hit. I don't think I many agree. audiences go, like take to that. I think they want a story that has a clear through line. And outside of just our main character here, who's in the whole movie, like it is weird to have a lot of characters show up for five minutes and then they're gone for the rest of the movie. Yeah. And I like that. You don't see that very often. I'm always for movies that take risks and do something different narratively. And I like that about the movie. I thought that was kind of fun. I agree. Yeah, I think it it worked for the story it was trying to tell. I do wonder how at the time, I wonder how audiences reacted. To, I, I don't believe Paul Newman was doing much com comedy, right? I mean, it, obviously, that's not what he's known for now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know what comedic films he had done up to that point. Um, but I wonder how yeah. that threw, threw people off as well. You know, just like maybe what did they expect going in? Yeah, I'd have to go through his filmography. I feel like he's done a few comedies or movies that are more lighthearted. Like, is it yeah. uh, Slapshot? I haven't seen Slapshot. That's later. I think that's more, that's after this. Yeah, that's like And 80s. then the Hudsucker Proxy in the 90s is yeah. kind of a comedy by the Coen brothers. But around this time, I think he's mostly known as a dramatic actor. So that yeah. also probably threw people like who went to see this. They're like, what? 
Yeah. <laughs> what yeah, is this movie? Sure. Why is Paul Newman? And it's not his typical handsome self. He's got the beard. Yeah. He's kind of hidden under facial hair in this. And yeah. it's a different kind of performance from him. It probably turned off a lot of the audience members too. Yeah, for sure. And, and the movie came out in December of 1972, where there's the Poseidon Adventure, there's Sleuth, there's the Heartbreak Kid. There's like a bunch of big movies, The Getaway. Mm, yeah. And and we talk about this every year, like December, it's always packed with a lot of great titles. And often one or two movies can kind of fall through the cracks. And that's the case. I feel like that's the case to this day. <laughs> when when yeah. you have like yeah. a thousand Oscar movies come out at the same time, only some of them are going to rise to the surface. And I feel like this, I feel like this movie had come out in August or September. Maybe it would have had more legs and yeah. be more of an audience, but I feel like it might have kind of come and gone in mid December of seventy two. Yeah, and I feel like exactly like you said earlier. I think I think not having a really solid through line of a story, just yeah. being more episodic, doesn't help the case. It is hard to get invested. I I, de- I definitely say would say I left the film uh, liking it overall for the for the humor. But as far as the story, I mean, there really isn't much going on. It's a guy <laughs> who is who declares himself the law of this town. Yep. And he kind of builds it up and wants to do whatever he wants. And that's kind of it. And there's just these little bits of adventure here and there as various people come into the town or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, there's just not much of a story mm-hmm. here kind of at all. Yeah. And director John Houston, he kind of attributed the the narrative elements to why it didn't uh perform well that 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 kind of scattershot nature uh he wrote in his autobiography called an open book which i didn't know john houston had an autobiography i would love to read it yeah i'm gonna add that to the uh he said it wasn't a massive failure but you couldn't call it a success it didn't take off as they say still there were some good things in it uh and then he and he talked about the scattershot nature of the storytelling I've made deliberate use of a technique that has since become much more popular, letting all sorts of events occur without logical justification. Things appear, things happen, <laughs> funny, sad, comic, dramatic, ludicrous, sober. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well he's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we, I feel, I, I'd have to think about it, but I'm, I'm sure more movies of the last like 20, 30 years have used that narrative element than anything did in the early seventies. You don't see that very much at, around this time, 50 years ago. Yeah, even for even for scattershot comedies like this, um, yeah, I'm trying to find a good. I'm trying to think of a good comparison around the time. I, I really can't. Um, I feel uh, like what, I don't know if you did. You think of Robert Altman at all when you were watching this? Like I a little bit. He's yeah, got, he's his. You know, when you think of like Nashville shortcuts, the player, he kind of bounces around to different characters and things. And while watching this movie, I was like, it kind of feels like it might have been directed by Robert Altman. Yeah, it's almost like Robert <laughs> Altman if he if he didn't have a fifteen person ensemble. You know, it was like <laughs> it's like if he if he narrowed it down to just one person and told, uh, that's the Robert Altman yeah. version of this. Yeah, because Altman's the master of like, let me get eighty six actors that you know, and we'll, I'll find <laughs> roles for them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it must have yeah. been it yeah, must but... have been fun for Houston to make this movie with so many great. There's so many great actors yeah. in this. It was a thrill to see each one come on screen. Yeah, really, really, and and like you said, in so many different and roles, we're not really used to seeing them. Um, even even random people. I don't know. I guess he wasn't very big at the time. But uh, one of the performances that stood out to me the most was Stacy Keach as Bad Bob. Which again, he's only in the movie. Spoilers. He's only in the movie for what a, a minute two, two or minutes. two uh <laughs> yeah and uh but i thought he was great i was really into what he was doing uh playing this albino villain uh yeah. just and yeah i think he was just really i think he was chewing the scenery he was really having a good time playing this uh really insane psychopath psychopathic villain um <laughs> who everyone's just, been who's never been taken down right ever. yeah never He's been taken down the, and then he just always comes out unscathed. <laughs> yep. And then he just gets shot in the back. <laughs> a giant Boom. hole blown out of his back. Yeah. Yep. Uh, they're they're uh, like, they're like, oh, you didn't even give him a chance. And Paul Newman's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the, that's such that's the theme of this movie is just kind of like a shrugging shoulders, like, all right, you know, like 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. They even did. You're right about the the, the hole in his back. They they literally <laughs> zoom in to the hole in his yeah. chest. Uh, it was so random. This movie is f- so filled with random little moments like that. Uh, it's yeah. so surprising. I love seeing Stacy Keach, especially because we just talked about a movie in June or July called Fat City. Also Fat City. direct. Also directed by John Huston and starring Stacy Keach in the lead role. Okay. And it's like okay. a it's like a boxing film, and it's co-stars Jeff Bridges and uh, Susan Terrell in an Oscar nominated role. We talked about that in July. I had some problems with it. It has it's also kind of weird narratively in that it's kind of like two movies in one, and hmm. we follow Jeff Bridges for a while, then we follow Stacey Keach, and then the last scene we get them like talking in a in a cafe in a diner. So it's kind of like one of those scatter like you're kind of following two narratives. Yeah. But then it's like it's like John Huston one ups it in this. He's like, I'm just gonna follow a lot of different narratives. For yeah. this movie. But in yeah. the same year, I I I would love to have heard that phone conversation. Like, hey, Stacy, <laughs> got I, something can, else for you. You have a day. Yeah. Can you, can, yeah. can you come out for a day? What am I yeah. playing? I'll, and I'll <laughs> I'll buy now. Who gets shot in the back in in your like second minute of the movie? I'm yeah. in, John. Yeah. Where do I go? I oh, felt what? like I I feel like um. I wonder if I can put the right words to this, but like one thing I was thinking as I was watching it, um, there's, there's plenty of John Houston films I've not seen. Um, right. So, so I'm not by any means a, an expert on his filmography. What I was feeling, the sense that I was getting as I was watching uh, Roy Bean was that it almost felt like this kind of John Houston having a feet in two worlds, like between modern cinema or like modern at the oh, time right. cinema mm-hmm. and uh, some of the old Hollywood like mm-hmm. features that he had directed when he was first getting started. Like there's there's I feel like, um, you know, like the African Queen is a great example of like kind of this classic Hollywood um uh, aging stars, like uh, mm-hmm. adventure, adventure film. Adventure story. Mm-hmm. Adventure story. And here I feel like that he's trying to blend that, that style with more energetic screwball kind mm-hmm. of, um, yeah. uh, you know, the sweeping sense of old Hollywood mixed with this, the kind of randomness that's going on mm-hmm. in uh, 70s cinema sometimes. So, so I don't know. I, did you get a sense of that at all? Kind of blending new Hollywood, old Hollywood? Yeah, well, that's, that's what makes these early 70s films kind of exciting because especially when you have the older directors like a John Huston, they're not just like at the turn of like the decade into 1970 and on going to be going to become different filmmakers. Mm-hmm. They like John Huston's first movie is The Maltese Falcon from 1941, mm-hmm. one of the great classic movies. Mm-hmm. So like he got his education in films of the 40s and 50s. So that's what makes watching these filmmakers kind of move on to the 70s and 80s really exciting because John Huston continued directing into the 80s. I believe he was like almost dying when he was making his last movie. Yeah, 87. Yeah, yep. All the dead. But uh, Pritzi's Honor is 85. That got lots of Oscar nominations and won an Oscar for Mm -hmm. Angelica Huston. And I feel like he's one of those filmmakers who could evolve as a filmmaker. He's not just like, like staying safe and and sticking to the past but i think we're we're only in 72 so he's probably Mm -hmm. still i think you're right he's got like one foot in each part of old hollywood new hollywood and then i mean i feel like once we get to wise blood which is really great film from 79 i feel like that's very much a movie of the 70s Mm -hmm. but i feel like this movie and uh the film the man who would be king with sean connery from 75 those feel kind of a still a little bit more old-fashioned and that's okay as long as we're still kind of trying new things pushing the medium forward yeah absolutely i I was uh reading up on you know john milius is i think john milius wrote the script yeah yeah he wrote the script and um he i I was a little confused by his comments about (laughs) what he thought the missteps of the film were he 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 envisioned this as a much more he he said more like sergey leone like the good Mm -hmm. the bad bad and the ugly yeah i don't see how that makes (laughs) sense i mean i haven't read the script so i don't know how how different this the script is from the final film Mm -hmm. um but I really have a hard time seeing how the tone of those films are anywhere similar. So he he said that John Huston made this a lot more comedic than he wanted it to be. Oh, even okay. though he said, even though he said his script was very comedic. 
even he said his script was much more comedic than this final film but he also envisioned it to be more like the good the bad and the ugly so um, i that doesn't I, make sense <laughs> i don't understand that at all i don't understand what it sounded to me as i was reading those comments i was like that kind of sounds like somebody who's trying to explain away a bad movie and this is not a bad movie but uh, you know he's trying to explain away its failures more than more than making a cohesive statement yeah so john milius wrote the script and he wanted to direct it with warren oates in the lead mm -hmm. He wanted to make it very cheap. He wanted to shoot in Spain in some crummy little town, a Sergio Leone leftover, and have Warren Oates play the judge. And I th then I guess the script somehow made it to leave Marvin. And he was working with Paul Newman on a 1972 film called Pocket Money that if you think the Judge Roy Bean movie is kind of like not, not very well known, I feel like Pocket Money. Yeah. Like I... I want to say earlier this year, I found a link and I watched 20 minutes of it. And it was just, it was very ordinary. It was okay, <laughs> yeah, but it sure. just was not worth watching the whole thing. Like that's a movie that's really under the radar for Paul Newman in 72. Right. But I guess like Paul Newman got a, got a hold of the script and he just responded to it. And he said, I want to make this. And I feel like Paul Newman is at a level where if he says, drop everything, I want to make this my next movie we we make it happen like yep whatever, exactly. you know so i don't know why paul newman couldn't make it with milius maybe milius was just too untested and he uh, wanted to yeah. make it a, a different way so we go yeah. with john houston yeah I, I am curious uh how john houston landed like uh, why he chose this as his project because it does seem a little bit outside of hit uh, not outside of his wheelhouse but yeah um he, he's made obviously classic westerns and adventure films but mm -hmm. um just something that th is so comedic and random to a degree um <laughs> uh and that that is what compelled him again going off of john's comments uh john milius's comments uh that he was the one who pursued a lot of them a lot of the comedy it's very strange i don't understand so, yeah, it said the producers were not happy with the prospect of Milius directing. So they paid a record price to just own the script and do what they want with it. $300,000. That's a lot of money That's in 71, huge, yeah. 72. That's huge. Yeah, I, I would. And then and then later, Milius has all these negative thing, things to say about the movie. I would just not say anything. Take exactly. the money and run on this one. <laughs> Write another movie. You know, yeah. you can try to direct that. But uh yeah, he, he later said John Huston ruined the movie. Uh, Milius was angry at the casting of cutesy pie Paul Newman. <laughs> Warren cutesy Oates pie. would have been much more suitable. However, apparently, on another page I looked at, this is one of Paul Newman's very favorite roles in his entire career. Really? I did not see that. That is fascinating. <laughs> I feel like this would have been a fun one for him to play because... He does get to have, there's more comedic elements. Yeah. He's often playing, you know, kind of drunk. And like, just like, yeah. he doesn't have to look cute. I feel like most of the movies around here, he has, he always looks very handsome. Yeah. And this yeah. one, he can just kind of let himself go a bit. And I how guess. much fun would it have been for Paul Newman to every few days, just see another great character actor walk into town and they probably could, you know, interact for a few days and then they're, they're gone. And then on to the next. And that, that, that was probably fun for him too. That episodic nature uh working with all these different actors yeah i guess you're probably right when he first said that i was like really why but i guess uh, honestly to a degree it, it he could prioritize the fun of playing a uh, somewhat despicable character um like this without having to do a lot of deep character work either because there's no yeah it's not you're not you're not going on a really strong arc throughout the whole course of this film right they kind of try to do some stuff with the time jump that we At can talk end. about but 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 really, yeah, maybe that was it. He's just kind of having fun without having to do the deep character work and yeah. just gets to play. So, yeah, Andy, yeah. and he gets to play with a bear. Like, why would that not be your favorite role? A bear bites a cigar out of his mouth. For It it looked real to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm a dummy, but that looked yeah. like a bear did really you, did that. Did, did that make you nervous at all? I was like, <laughs> they let this bear just, like, walk around Paul Newman and all these scenes. And I'm like, I mean, you, I mean, I've seen horrific videos yep. on the on the internet of like 
a bear being all lovey dovey and then just like turns around and eats the guy's head off. Right. And exactly. I'm like, this is Paul Newman. Like, I like they're, they like, bonded over the swing takes. <laughs> the, the swinging really cemented their relationship, Brian. So, yeah, they, they weren't worried about it. But isn't there there's isn't there a scene where like that, like the head, like Paul Newman's head is like right next to the bear. And I'm like, whoa, oh, yeah. oh, he literally <laughs> bites a cigar out of yeah. his mouth. He yeah, like, exactly. like chomps right on his cigar, a short cigar, I should say. It wasn't like some crazy thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then they throw the guy. Uh, I forget which character it is. They throw. Uh, it was the other lawyer, the lawyer who tries to uh, the uh, Roddy McDowell he, character. Yeah. He, yeah. He says he owns the property. <laughs> they throw him in the cage with this real bear. Yeah. And <laughs> like, there's like white shots. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. Roddy McDowell, did he have like some sort of life insurance on set? Like what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the bear was, I mean, it was a smaller bear than what we often see. Sure. I think, I think the bear was young, so it probably couldn't have done too much damage. But I don't know if I'm like a character actor, I'm on set for three days. I don't know if I'd agree to be in a cage with a real bear. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'd say up Wild. my price. Wild. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it must have been fun for him to play. We do get some action scenes. He gets to shoot a mm -hmm. gun a lot. Uh, I mean, the movie opens with a really kind of high octane action scene. He goes into this bar and, you know, they w w I mean, he wakes up and he's like outside like tied up and mm -hmm. they've taken all of his money and then he just goes on a rampage a la sergio leone like just yeah goes in there and just like shoots up the place and that's like minute four mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and that's and that's what made this watching this with kind of very little context uh made it so fascinating because it does open that way so you're like yeah. okay awesome here's this action movie we're about to watch and then it just turns it, that is not what the rest of the movie is like at all yeah, and that's like the only movement we ever get from Paul Newman after. That. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he's seated basically the rest of the movie. And then the rest yeah. of the movie, he's like in his chair outside of his little shack and he's like, okay. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And a uh, lot of great character actors. You mentioned Stacey Keach. I thought it was really interesting if you're, if like you know your history of like LGBTQ actors to have Anthony Perkins come in. Yeah. Who's great. And then once he's gone, then Tab Hunter comes in right after him. I don't know those, Tab Hunter. Those two actors were in a relationship for years. Really? When okay. they were like young and they had to be in, you know, in the closet. Yeah. So whenever they went, went outside, they had girlfriends, all the premieres they would go to with women. But they were in, I, I want to say it was a few years they were in a relationship together. Anthony Prior Perkins, to this? Yeah. Oh yeah, like in the late late, okay. late 50s I want to say. Okay. Okay. Like Tab Hunter and and uh Anthony Perkins and then they're in this movie back to back. I thought that was really interesting. I yeah. probably total coincidence. <laughs> well, uh, like they're I not on thought, screen together, but I also thought uh hold on, I have to pull up the um the Wikipedia page again. I'm sure you have it right there with you. Um yeah. it also says that he had didn't it say he had an affair with uh yeah, with Victoria Principal in this film, which was who, who uh, did Anthony Perkins. Anthony Perkins had an affair with Victoria Principal. That's according yeah. to Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia, yeah. No, he, no, he. Uh, Anthony Perkins uh, eventually married a woman. Like yeah. he, his sexuality <laughs> was on the yeah. spectrum. Yeah, totally. But totally. Uh, but he, yeah, he was definitely he romanced uh, men as well. And and there's uh, there's all sorts of stories with pictures yeah, yeah. and like they were clearly there was something going on with with him and Tab Hunter. And I, I keep saying, no one's listening. We need we need to make the movie about the relationship between Anthony Perkins and Tab Hunter and make it <laughs> and make it soon because Andrew Garfield oh, looks, yeah. looks just like Anthony Perkins. He does, yeah. And Anthony Perkins, I mean, he's I think he's like in his late thirties around the time of making Judge Roy Bean. And, okay. and uh, Andrew Garfield is in his late 30s. So I'm like, if we're going to make a movie about the romance with Tab Hunter, kind of good at going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that really would be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, and who I doesn't want to see who doesn't want to see the making of Judge Roy Bean on screen <laughs> as well? You know, they have to cover it. <laughs> yeah. We just talked about another Anthony Perkins movie a few weeks ago called Play It As It Lays, based on the novel by Joan Didion and Tuesday Weld is the star. Anthony Perkins is like the second lead of that movie. He's in much more of that movie, but uh, I don't know about you. I I'm such a massive fan of Psycho that any time yeah. that Anthony Perkins pops up in a movie, even for five minutes, I'm just a very happy guy. 
Oh yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> he's phenomenal. Yeah, and absolutely. he's I I I I find him very handsome. I've always found Anthony Perkins yeah. handsome, and in this movie, he's got a, he's got kind of a rugged quality with the with like a beard, but he's looking good. He's like I'm oh. like when he was gone, I was like God, we let's have him be. <laughs> Like, come back let's have him be the assistant or something <laughs> right but uh but speaking of his scene in tab hunter what do you make of that very weird choice to have these guys who are just in the movie for five minutes uh deliver voiceover after uh, yeah. they are dead like they tell they say in the voiceover about how they died and that's the only time we hear them in the movie in voiceover that was very odd it was very fantastic. <laughs> that that's kind of that's kind of what I was getting at with the um kind of one foot in old Hollywood, one foot in new. Not that I, of course, they still yeah. do have all, still done narration, but it it felt like a very old style of a choice. Um, yeah, and and uh, they're not the only ones who have voiceovers, right? I didn't write down. Does I, Roy Bean have any narration? I, I feel like remember. he has some. I feel yeah. like that choice. It. I feel like the second half of the movie, you don't really get it as much yeah. or at all. It was like very. Stacey Keach doesn't have one, right? No, not no, not at all. And I, that's the thing. I, there's so many choices in here that are just kind of thrown at the wall, and the the narration was kind of interesting, actually. Like it, it was kind of working for me that they. It just felt so random that it was a very interesting way to tell a little bit more story um, without having to really act it out. I don't know. It was it was such an odd choice, but it worked. Like, I just, I, I want to know, was that in the script by Milius? Was that right. John Huston's idea? Like, let's have these guys narrate a, as as they <laughs> leave the frame for the final time at the beginning and tell us how they died. It's like, what? Okay, yeah. that's a choice. That's yeah. not just an accident. <laughs> yeah, so strange. So strange. Maybe Paul Newman walked in, was like, I got an idea. <laughs> um, so let's, yeah, let's talk a little bit about, a little bit more about Paul Newman. Like, so what's, been your relationship with the actor paul newman like in terms of his career films he made before and after this uh like what is what like what do you make of him and his career uh I, I, there's so many paul newman movies i have not seen surprisingly mm -hmm. um so i've i've seen the hits i've seen of course butch cassidy sundance kid which is i i found it interesting that uh john milius did wrote this and jeremiah johnson in the same oh, year okay um just we're getting to that in a few months. We're gonna, yeah. The last episode of 72 is going to be Jeremiah Johnson. Okay. All right. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, that's just an interesting coincidence, I guess. Um, uh, but, yeah. So Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, you know, uh, a lot of his newer stuff. Um, uh, what's – oh, my gosh. His his last Oscar nomination uh, with uh, Tom Road, Road to Perdition. Yeah, Road to Perdition. Which Jeez, I just watched again for its uh, 20th anniversary. Every month I pick one movie – that came out 20 years ago. It's not for the podcast, it's yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. And in July, I picked Road to Perdition. I only saw it opening weekend. I'd never seen it since. It's great. And it's really good. <laughs> it's so dark. I love I love that like, film. How did this yeah. come out in July? Yeah. Who yeah, made and then, that choice? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that a, is that, that is, is very a strange. December movie with a capital D. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh so yeah, so you know, the hustler. Um, you know, I so I've seen a lot of the big hits, but I, I really don't know a lot. This is definitely a deeper cut in terms of Paul Newman yeah. for me, for sure. Yeah. Have you seen or heard of that uh, HBO series called The Last Movie Stars, which is no. all about Paul Newman and his wife Joanne Woodward and their careers and their uh relationship? Yeah, no, I really want to see it. Ethan Hawke directed it. Ethan right? Hawke directed really, it. It's, yeah, I really uh, want to check it out. Five hours, six hours, and okay. I started it on a Friday night, and I finished it on a Sunday morning, and it's like all I was doing that Saturday. <laughs> like, nice. And nice. It, it it is so thorough. I'm pretty sure it has a segment. It's been a couple months since I watched it. I, I'm pretty sure there is a segment on Judge Roy Bean. Like, over the course of the five or six episodes, like, it goes through in chronological order like each decade and what movies yeah. they were both making they were in like 10 or more movies together yeah. um he directed her in some stuff and and uh and it talks about like this part of his career it's a little bit of a slump mm -hmm. like the year before this we talked about uh, a movie called sometimes a great notion which came out at the end of 71 uh, we talked about that about a year ago and that's a movie that he took over the directing reins mm. I can't remember what happened to the director he got fired or something happened and paul newman finished directing the movie and that's another movie that's hard to pin down, like what genre it is. And it's got moments of, of serious tragedy, moments of, of humor. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's like he's kind of in a slump here. Yeah. 
I feel yeah. like he comes back a bit with the sting a year later. That's December yep. of 73. Yep. And that's the best picture winner. So that's, that puts him back on top, I would say. But right now, not everyone is flocking to the next Paul Newman movie. Paul Newman movie, it looks like, because the last two or three he's done, I think one's called Wasp. That was like a huge flop. Pocket Money, also 72, a flop. So this is like a low point in his mostly pretty celebrated career right now. Yeah, which makes me wonder why he years later would say that this is one of his favorite roles. I wonder, maybe maybe he was feeling, sometimes sometimes in career downturns, yeah. you also have more freedom. So I wonder if he felt like he could just kind of mess around, you know, kind of try stuff. Yeah, I've heard actors talk about that. Sometimes it's not great to just have five huge hits in a row because then there's yeah. a lot of pressure and there's waiting yeah. to fall. But when you're yeah in the downswing, it's like, oh, now I can just have a little fun and try things and... Uh, I think about, you know, he probably, you know, 10 years before this, when he was really big off of movies like HUD, HUD and, yeah. and uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, maybe he was, especially when he was younger and like just really gorgeous, didn't have the opportunities. The Hustler, another great one from the yeah. early 60s. Like, I feel like he's finally aging into like being able to be more of a character actor in the 70s. He doesn't have to be the most gorgeous man on the screen at all times. I think that's probably why he likes the role too. He doesn't have to be the handsome Paul Newman like he was in almost everything up until this point. <laughs> yeah, <Right>? yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it does feel like he has more, he, 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 obviously there's still big movies from the seventies, like The Sting, like you said, uh, but he also has the resurgence like in the eighties with, like we said, Slapshot and um, uh, Scorsese, Lord. Uh, uh, Color of Money. Color of Money, Hustler sequel. Um, you know, I, so I think, I, I wonder if uh, the 70s was just more him figuring out how to be more of a character actor, like yeah. you're saying, instead mm -hmm. of just be the handsome guy. Because I, I, I have always thought that he does, in, in terms of his acting style, he does feel more like a character actor who was just too handsome, who became like this the massive uber movie star. Um, but I think he fits like Judge Roy Bean. He fits that that sort of interesting, strange character actor a little bit better, I feel like. Yeah. And he has such stature as an actor and with his presence, like he he can play something kind of different, but you're not going to put Paul Newman in the corner and have him play like one of these five minute cameos. Like he's right. like, there's something about him. He has to be kind of like the overlord of the 100%. movie, like watching um, even in a movie like Road to Perdition, where he is a supporting role like his presence lingers throughout that movie when he's not in yep. the film. Like we think about him and like what he's, what he might do when this happens. And uh, you know, he's, he's just one of the greats, like one of the, yeah. one of the great actors. And uh, the, what I took away from the last movie stars was God, there's so many movies he's in. I've never seen. I yeah. Never seen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For I've seen sure. most of the big ones. Like if you haven't seen the hustler, that was That's my great, pick. Yeah. Last year, uh, when we talked about the, the our three favorite Paul Newman movies, mm -hmm. I think if there was an, an older one, you ha if you haven't seen uh, the Hustler from '61, is great. Yeah, <laughs> I love that movie. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I Color of Money. It's kind of cool that he came back and did a 25 years later sequel. It's not one of my favorite Scorsese movies, or yeah. that that's the one he won an Oscar for. It's kind of a weird. It's very a weird. Asterisk. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I it's, feel like it was very much we want to give Paul Newman an Oscar, and that's fine. I'm I'm not mad that you want to do that, but yeah, like he's nominated for the verdict four years before. And so much better. And he's in the audience with Joanne Woodward, and she is sitting next to him clapping crazily. And you can see him like he looks like he wants that one because mm. he is great in the verdict. Oh, that's the verdict that's is amazing. One of his top three to five best performances. Yeah. He's so good in that. Yeah. But that was the year of Gandhi. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so then he I, he he goes to most of them. He decides to stay home. Uh, color of money year because he says, maybe if I stay home, I'll finally get one. And then he won. <laughs> worked. Yeah. Yeah. So then he's there the next year to give best actress to share. He shows up in 95 when he's nominated for Nobody's Fool. That's the year of Forrest Gump. So mm -hmm. he never got to have outside. He got a uh, an honorary Oscar. Uh, Tom Cruise presented him. I want to say the early 90s. And he was there for that. And he gave a speech. But he never got to give a 
acceptance speech for a competitive Oscar, which yeah. is kind of crazy to think in, the, it in is. his long career that never happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at least he's got the gold. You know, there are so you know people like Peter O'Toole or you know yeah. pe- people who just never who just never got it. Uh, yeah. You know, or I might I might have made a, an hour long video about Glenn Close this last summer, a video that almost killed me. Yeah, uh, that was like <laughs> that was like a two week just like not, not don't have it. when someone calls can't do it today. I got to focus on my Glenn Close video because I had to go deep into eight different yeah. Oscar races and talk about why she never won. And yeah. it's so hard because it's like like I almost think I want her to win her Oscar more than she does. Right. It's, like, it's I don't taking on its cared. own narrative. Yeah. I don't. And that's the thing is I, we definitely care more. I think she does care. I think she that's why you somewhat. see That's why you see the face when, uh, when Olivia Coleman wins. <laughs> I think you can tell, you know, there's an expectation there. But I think, I do think the, the internet cares more than she does. <laughs> yeah. Do you, this, this has nothing to do with Judge Roy Bean, that's uh, okay. but that's okay. Uh, do you think Glenn Close is going to win an Oscar? I think. In the next five years, there's going to be an honorary Oscar for her. Mm. Maybe 10. I was, I was going to say, five years seems seems short. But she's yeah. se- I think she's 73, 74, somewhere around there. I feel like if, because Peter O'Toole got an honorary Oscar in 03, I want to say he was around 80 then. I, f- I feel like we have a different relationship to aging stars, though. Mm. I feel like, I feel like, because Peter O'Toole obviously got started way before Glenn Close did. It's almost like Glenn Close feels younger than Peter O'Toole did um, because he came from a different era of Hollywood. So I almost feel like it feels like when you say honorary Oscar, I agree, but then it feels like too soon, even though it's probably not. I mean, right now is too soon. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like if they give her the honorary Oscar in the next five to 10 years, then there will be less of a, you know, you know, uh, expectation that she has to win a competitive one. So I, I feel like at this point, unless, unless I'm proven wrong, I feel like her best chance at an Oscar win is a really juicy supporting role in something. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, she's in a new movie by Lee Daniels coming in 2023. Mm-hmm. They've released two pictures that she's playing something, but I read the the concept of it. It, it sa- sounds like there's like supernatural elements to it. So mm. I'm like, oh, maybe not. Yeah, my confidence but... in Lee Daniels. I'm like, I don't know. But you know, Monique won. Yeah, so yeah. it's like you know, if a director has uh, directed someone to an Oscar win, I'm always like, hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be a juicy supporting role in something where she just sweeps the season. I think if there was ever a moment where again she wins golden globe she wins sag and it's a supporting role i think that it's over like she has to yeah. win. <laughs> but yeah. um but yeah so you have like someone like paul newman even though he didn't actually uh accept that oscar at least he won something yeah exactly <laughs> at least he's got it he's got it on his shelf you know so yeah uh he did not get a nomination for judge roy bean <laughs> <laughs> the outrage the outrage how so, could this have happened? Yeah, so we should talk about, so it comes out in December. The reviews are mixed. Roger Ebert yeah. gives it two and a half stars. He says it doesn't have flow. It keeps stopping and starting. Uh, Variety said the two-hour running time is not fleshed out with anything more than scenic vignettes, mm. uh, sometimes attempting to recreate the success of Butch Cassidy. Uh, and then Gene Siskel gave it two stars. And he just said, he, he said he didn't even like the uh, character Paul Newman plays, <laughs> wow. which I liked him. Like I, I liked like, him. Yeah. I feel like if you don't like the the Roy Bean character, this is a slog because you're yeah. just like, what am I watching? <laughs> and if you're just, if I feel like you have a choice near the beginning, once, once the movie shows you that it's going to be episodic, you have a choice. Am I in or am I out? And mm-hmm. if you're, if you're not digging that there's not much of a story here, you're gonna it's gonna be a slog like i understand why people would call this a slog even though i don't feel that way yeah i definitely see why i mean because there isn't much hooking you in it's either the jokes are landing for you and the random episodes are are interesting or there's (laughs) nothing else for you here yeah even i do like i do like judge roy bean i think he's a interesting different character and he's he's very funny like that scene where he's losing at cards right so 
he's like that beer is what is he was it like a hundred bucks or something right like, right yeah something exactly outrageous and he's like oh well if you want it to be a dollar yeah. then you need to give me some of your chips or and then what does he say to those women he's like i'm i am so so sorry i called you a whore or something yeah and then, right and then he's like you know i you know i didn't say this about you and then he and then he says like 10 more horrific things about them <laughs> right to their yeah. faces and he's like but i apologize <laughs> yeah yeah and they're like their eyes are going big and so he's really leaning into the comedy of the he situations is. even the shooting of of stacy keach's character is hilarious yeah. just and he comes hobbling out yeah nine years before raiders of the lost ark it, yeah i thought Did the that same thing you of that oh 100 like, john houston sets up that scene as a as a big duo duel to to the death and yep. It's just over with the shot of the gun. He's like, oh, okay. And it very if nine years before Raiders, which yep. was done, they had choreographed a fight, but Harrison mm -hmm. Ford had the runs. He had exactly eaten the wrong thing for lunch and said, <laughs> Steven, I need to go lay down. Yep. And Steven's like, How do we make our day? How about you just shoot him? <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> everybody like always talks about that scene. And yeah, I thought the exact same thing. I was like, this 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 did it first yeah and it's and it's a funny it's a funny sequence and like we said earlier the whole zoom in to the to the gaping hole the gaping wound in his, <laughs> in his chest like it's a goofy scene but it, it's funny like it works and he just falls over just boom like there's no like done. look back or anything it's just nope done <laughs> yeah moving on moving on next thing yeah, and uh, Victoria Principal, she got a Golden Globe nomination for most promising newcomer female. I, yeah. I apparently the Golden Globes are coming back uh, for one year at least. Yeah, yeah, so one January. Year I'm like, bring back the most promising newcomer. I like that category. I, I, I am. I'm a little mixed on the category. I like that it, it, it gives us a glimpse into some people who wouldn't have like she was never going to get an oscar nomination for no. this role but now <laughs> but now she gets this this nomination that we can talk about so it, it does have a few interesting things like that i feel like it would i, I feel like uh it would it not, would have to be a diverse slate that would it would be the, exactly yeah. exactly i feel like it would get dominated uh by like superhero movies so, something bad would happen <laughs> to that category i think it would get abused right away well, uh, yeah, I, well, I shouldn't say I, I should I should uh, go back. I don't ne necessarily need it now, but I but I do like the idea of the category at the time. Yeah, because 50 years on, I get a sense of like who was kind of like up and coming in 72. Exactly. And exactly. it gives you a little bit of a glimpse as like who who are they thinking about? Um, So, yeah, she was she was OK in the like she doesn't ha she yeah. doesn't really have much to do. Yeah, right. she really doesn't. She's she's not. There's one of my favorite vis visually one of my favorite scenes is them um in the field. It's near the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's when they start to kind of sort of fall in love. Yeah, and um that that scene is gorgeous. It's it's the most yeah. beautiful scene in the movie by far. It, the cinematography almost it's almost like a, it's out of a different film. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's completely this golden hour backlit on the actors uh yellow fields everything's just yellow it's a gorgeous sequence mm -hmm. and then they never do like and almost anything like that <laughs> throughout the whole rest of the film uh but the cinematography was was good throughout um there are some, yeah. really, some moments that really stood out like technically the movie's fine like as you say there's some moments where the cinematography there's some nice like editing choices like some dissolves and things but mm -hmm. uh yeah, there's nothing really in it that's like, oh, this is deserving of an Oscar nomination. That's like, you know, that could be, you know, considered better than five other movies. I don't know about the yeah. song. The only Oscar nomination. Yeah. The song did not <laughs> stick. It, it really is. Uh, whichever quote that you read from one of the critics is right. It was totally trying to repeat the success of butch cassie like it, it feels oh, like a raindrops <laughs> oh yeah that was you yeah you're great yeah, yeah. It, it, it really feels exactly like that that's I what mean, it reminded me of yeah and so i was a little surprised it got a nomination i mean the song is fine it's not a bad song it just i, I can't re i can't even remember the melody of it right now like it's something that yesterday. yeah it's something that it wouldn't have surprised me if it happened in, in butch cassie they're you know they're on the bike and mm -hmm. raindrops are falling on my head and then it just dissolves into them pushing a bear on a swing it would <laughs> exactly. i would have been like okay exactly this fits. Uh, here there's a little bit more of a setup 
yeah like how they got the bearer <laughs> i like john houston's like minute in the movie he's just like yeah he's like an old grump he's like i'm gonna be dead soon take the bear yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take, take care of it and it's so weird. and it's just like the bear's like running around and and paul newman's like what do we do what do we do and then a few minutes later they're just pushing it on a swing he Love just he just yells at the bear. He just screams in the bear's face, and and that's how they bonded. We should mention the bear dies at one point in kind of a horrific scene. That's true. I forgot. And about that. like we see, there's like blood all over, and Paul Newman he just looks at the bear, walks over, and just starts drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they and then they give the bear this beautiful send off, like they have like this um, huge statue with like a yep. you know like a sketched out like a outline of the bear on it and uh it's like a it's like a beautiful little scene like giving it like giving a final toast to this bear who's just kind of been a part yeah. of the movie and you it's know, one of the most heartfelt up. moments of the of the <laughs> film <laughs> yeah and then so the end uh, the movie lost me a little bit because we have this jump in time he we have a scene where he's like he's desperate for a boy he's like i can't live forever yeah give me a boy which is always oh that's a great thing to say yeah, to your super, female co-star yeah super healthy and then she has a very difficult pregnancy and she dies mm -hmm. and it's a girl. And he soon after that, he leaves, right? He like leaves yeah. the town and then we cut forward in time. 20 years, he comes back and she's now 20 years old. And that's just what the last 10 minutes of the movie, 15. Yeah. It's, it's very, very brief. Man. Yeah. So it's kind of like I feel like if you're gonna have that big of a jump, we need to flesh it out. And I feel like I feel like that segment needed to be a little longer for it to have any power because it's just so quick. It I felt like that time jump took me out a little bit. Did that uh, oh yeah feel the same it, way? Yeah, it, it it I feel like the movie thought it was gonna be a really emotionally resonant, like this mm -hmm. whole he meets his daughter who's 20 years old. It's interesting. But because the the film hadn't really developed a, an, an investment in the story, there's just not much emotional resonance there. It's fine. And then they burn the whole town down. Um, <laughs> the which, whole town gets burnt down. Yeah. Exactly yeah. I'm right. like, it, like it, it just really jumped really fast. Like they crammed all of this story for the first time in the last, whatever it is, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, it just didn't it didn't really land for me, even though the, the sequence of the town burning down is actually really well shot, really mm -hmm. interesting. But yeah, the emotional vestment was gone at that point. And uh, Jacqueline Bissett plays uh, mm -hmm. Rose at 20. Yeah. That's that. She's a big name. She's been yeah, around yeah. forever. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, she does what she can with a very small role. But I feel like to have that father daughter story take flight, it's just too brief. It's not it long enough. I don't know if I don't know if the movie's like third act needed to be all about that, but there's just yeah. something missing there. So I felt like the 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 ending's a little bit of a little clunky. And as I you know, the ending of a movie is so important, especially yeah. if you're kind of like so so about it, kind of leaning positive. If the last ten minutes doesn't land, it's like eh. And and then after that, <laughs> you know? after that, it goes into the the whole thing with Lily Langtree, right? Yeah. Um, who's been a, like on his wall, right? But again, same same problem there. I feel like that was supposed to be this big emotional moment of, wow, this person who he's loved and admired for all these years, for decades now, shows up in the town. But there's it, it doesn't really it's kind of like, OK, cool. That's great. It's Ava Gardner. That's awesome. But yeah, it's Ava Gardner, who yeah. looks gorgeous. He does. Yeah. At, she was 50. Yeah. When she did this. But and she's kind a of... very famous actress. I mean. What was she most popular in the, I would say the forties and the fifties. Right? Oh yeah. 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 And, and she has this little cameo. It's like, yeah, okay. that's the thing. It's a cameo that kind of leads to nothing. And that's the end of our movie. That's it right there. <laughs> so, okay. I wasn't invested in the poster on his wall. I know he kept talking about her, talking about her character, but I wasn't really invested in that. So yeah, it feels like it was a misguided ending in thinking that we were mo much more invested in, in these characters than we really were. Yeah. I did like the the age makeup at the end. I thought that looked pretty good for yeah. 72. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, agree. they make uh, Newman's, just his his beard is all white now. But even like uh, Ned Beatty, we haven't mentioned him. Yeah. This was a big year for Ned Beatty. He's a mm -hmm. very famous part of Deliverance, which mm -hmm. came out in the summer of 72. And uh, 
and I believe that was his first feature film role. That's what we talked about on the episode. Okay. So this would have been his second or third. Uh, he's great. He's he's fantastic too. He's in. He, yeah. He's one of the few characters outside of Roy Bean who's in the whole kind of the whole movie. Like he yeah. comes in early on. He's always a side character. He's like over at the bar. I, I think he's probably my favorite side performance in the yeah. film. T- Treaker, Treaker, what's his name? He's got a yeah. strange name, Treaker. Uh, so let's see. So he is Te- Te- Tector. Tector, Tector Cretes. Tector Cretes. Yeah, <laughs> he he's barely in the movie, but he has some really nice like sidelines that he says uh, to Roy Bean throughout. And then, yeah, just by the fact of him sticking around for all these decades, he gets a little bit more to do than some of the other characters. Yeah. And so, yeah, I thought he was great. Yeah, and apparently Richard Farnsworth plays one of the outlaws, future Academy, two-time Academy Award nominee Richard Farnsworth, <laughs> whose last movie famously was a, uh, David Lynch's G-rated The Straight Story, and Great who movie. is in one of my favorite movies of all time, Misery. He's the yes. sheriff in Misery, basically a two-person movie, Kathy Bates and James Caan. But then I don't think that movie works without Richard Farnsworth. <laughs> as the sheriff yeah. who comes uh comes a knocking at her door uh he's apparently in this movie as outlaw i did not recognize him <laughs> yeah i did not recognize him either have you seen the straight story oh yeah 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 it's i so finally good. it was the last uh david lynch movie i had never seen okay and uh in 2019 i taught a college course a writing course where we every uh, semester i'd pick a different director and i'd incorporate mostly clips and we'd watch one of the films and the last one I did was David Lynch. And I was like, I've seen everything. I've never seen the straight story. So like two weeks before the I made the syllabus, I was like, let me just watch this. And I did incorporate some clips from that movie in, a, in one of the lessons. And uh, it was such a lovely film. It, yeah, I love that that's in his filmography. It's, it's so it's weird. It's so weird that it's in his filmography because <laughs> it's not weird. I mean, it's it's not your typical film, but it's it's not strange like many of Lynch's films. Yeah, but it's, you can see him in it. Like there's sure. like elements to the straight story. You can see a bit of of David Lynch, but it's like you you keep waiting for him to push <laughs> it, and he doesn't. He just yeah. Let's it just like even at the end, you're like, mm-hmm. okay, he's gonna give us a little Lynchian. Nope. He yep. just tells that story and it was right around the time he made Mulholland Drive. So yeah. he like got to like he got all of his, you know, nightmares out in Mulholland <laughs> Drive and then he could make the straight story yeah. in a different yeah. way. But it, it was proof that he if he wanted to make different kinds of films that wasn't his kind of typical Lynchian nightmare world, like he he, he had it in him to do it. Yeah. Respect for, I mean, <laughs> sticking with what he wants to do. I mean, it's great. Obviously, he's a master. And yeah, I, yeah, I think the straight story is is very underseen, um, very sweet, mm-hmm. uh, interesting film. So yeah, an early, uh, very small role for Richard Farnsworth. Yeah. And then, as I said, it, like I'm always intrigued by the, by the one off Oscar nominations when a movie gets one. And mm-hmm. uh, we just talked about Images a few weeks ago, a Robert Altman movie mm. that got one Oscar nomination for Score. For John Williams, it always intrigues me when it's like, well, we didn't really like your movie to give it much of anything, <laughs> but we'll give it like this one nomination. Yeah. So then you're in the record, you're in the Oscar record books forever somewhere. Yep. It's yep. like, uh, like some of these movies that come along every year that I love that are kind of on the cusp of getting like one nomination. Ruth Nega in passing, like yeah. almost yep. happens, but doesn't. I'm like, well, now I feel like that one nomination can keep the movie a little bit more alive in years to come because you're going to have, especially young people who are just looking at Oscar uh, nomination lists could see Ruth Nega passing. What's this? Watch it. But when it's not there, especially when it's like on Netflix, like as a streamer. Yeah, there's no box office or anything. It just kind of floats away. So uh, not to say that uh, a best song nomination will get you there, but <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. We've had in '72. There's a lot of movies we talked about that get like one acting nomination hmm. or one, you know, nomination for script or something. Uh, so this one's not one of the big ones, and I didn't think that song was very good. So this, no. like, if you had to give this movie one nomination, like, what do you think you would give it? Like, if it, if it had gotten one, I'm trying to yeah. think. Would it be like a technical, like a editing or cinematography, or would you yeah. go for an acting uh, performance? 
Yeah, I was leaning towards editing or cinematography. I don't think any of the actors, including Paul Newman, mm, are awesome. That would have been a weird nomination. Yeah. And Paul Newman's great in the film. That Beatty's great. But like nobody, there's nobody that says, that screams like nomination worthy. Yeah. I, I think maybe the honest answer is I probably wouldn't nominate it for anything. <laughs> um, that's the honest answer. But if, if you're making me choose, uh, honestly, um uh what art direction what did they call it at the time maybe was, art direction art set direction. decoration yeah, um that's what i was uh, was was pretty interesting uh you yeah. know they kind of built i mean i'm assuming they built this whole town mm -hmm. from nothing and then it and it grows like as the film goes uh the the town kind of grows and grows mm -hmm. so our, the the art direction is is interesting in the film again probably not nomination worthy if i'm being <laughs> honest but maybe that's probably the thing i admired the most i guess yeah I don't know. Maybe, maybe the script, maybe Milius could have been there. <laughs> yeah. The comedy works. I mean, it's the comedy a, works. It's kind of a weird, yeah. Yeah. it'd be kind of like a cool, like a weird uh, screenplay nomination, like, yeah. like kind of that fifth slot. Yeah. But um, yeah. so yeah, the song gets in and it also got in at the golden globes. And then as I said, Victoria principal, yeah, this was never going to be a big Oscar player. I think if the movie had come out earlier in the year, it probably would have got nothing. Maybe yeah. it was yeah. like a December release. They're like, well, we should give it something. It's Paul Newman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. I don't know. But, uh, but that's okay. Paul Newman's going to have a, a huge hit mm -hmm. a year from now with The Sting. And then the last piece of trivia I had on here was, I guess, a, a music cue from this movie called Miss Lily Langtree uh, appears in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, really? By, I did by not Tarantino. know so interesting and i feel like he oh that came up uh we talked about uh last house on the left a few weeks ago by wes craven mm -hmm. and uh a song from that movie appeared in the hateful eight hmm. so okay. tarantino like digs up these old songs music cues from films of like the 60s and 70s and then he just puts it in his new movie <laughs> yeah it's no surprise to me i didn't know that it's no surprise though uh tarantino just picks he knows these obscure random the last house on the left is less obscure but he knows these just obscure things about <laughs> old hollywood films so that, yeah. yeah that that is not that surprising yeah do you see that game he what was it was it uh kimmel or something where they were playing a movie game where uh kimmel would just give him like a one sentence synopsis of just the most obscure <laughs> old movie you could ever imagine and he's sitting there and he's like Knows the title. Knows the title. <laughs> that's like, crazy. Yeah, I that's mean, wild. I'm I'm not great when you give me a synop like a short summary of a movie or something, or I'm really bad with quotes. People oh think, yeah, I can't do people it. People yeah. think I know everything about movies, but if someone gives me, unless it's a quote that I'm very familiar with, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> same. You know, I I have I always have this. Uh, I don't know if you can share the same experience. Uh, anytime somebody wants to do like a trivia night at like a bar or something. Yeah. Um. And anytime there's like a movie category or if it's yeah. movie theme, everyone looks at you, everybody looks at me and yeah. I have this anxiety because then I'm like, I I'm bad at trivia. Like, yeah, I know a lot about movies, but when the pressure is <laughs> on and they ask such specific questions, it's like, well, you know, maybe I haven't seen that movie. Uh, it's, that's uh, it's that's so funny. You mentioned be. that for, for the first time in a long time, uh, went, went with some friends to a trivia night four nights ago, and it was a mix of different categories. Mm. and. Uh, the first uh, question was a sports question. I don't know anything about sports. Yeah. I'm out. I knew yeah. the answer. <laughs> oh, hey, nice. There you go. It was what sport uh, has a face-off? You know, the hockey. sport that has hockey. Yeah. All right. Okay. So hey, that. there you go. I'm like, I know. And I was the one in the group who said it first. I said, I think that's hockey. Nice. And then the second question was, who, uh, what actor voiced such and such character in the movie Over the Hedge? Oh yeah. And everyone yeah. looked at me. Yeah. And I went, <laughs> gun to my head. I couldn't tell you one actor who voiced any character in this movie, let alone whatever this guy is. Exactly. That's so, the and, thing. And the answer was Bruce Willis. And I said, You know what? I, I that would have what... been that would have been my like 97th guess if I had to guess. <laughs> that actually popped in my head when you said that. I have oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know if I've seen over the hedge. But no, it's the same. It's this they ask such specific questions. So if you haven't seen the movie, it doesn't matter if you're the movie guy you know but i made up for it later i was feeling really down on myself for not knowing I, there were like four movie questions i knew the other ones i didn't know the first one i was like oh i missed that movie yeah, yeah. but then at the end one of the last like big like it was like an 80 pointer question was what actor from apollo 13 who uh who, where you can hear his voice uh in gravity 
Oh, Ed Harris. Ed Harris. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, there were like 10 groups. I was the only person nice. in the whole place who knew that answer. Nice. Yeah. A lot of people That's... put Tom, Tom Hanks. Sure, sure. I'm like, Tom yeah. Hanks is not in gravity. He's not in gravity. <laughs> yeah. That, if they did, if they, if there's an Oscars trivia night, I'm there. And yes. if I miss, if I miss those, okay, you can shame me. But yeah, just there was a, movie, it's too broad. There was a final Jeopardy question. I remember a few years ago where he said the category is the Oscars <laughs> and he comes back from commercial and it was some really tough, obscure question. Like of all the such and such you've won, what's the one that didn't do this? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> that would have killed me. Exactly. Imagine yeah. being on Jeopardy and it's like the category I can slay and I don't know. Yep. The answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, but usually, usually if it's an Oscars question, I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same. I'm really good with dates. That's where I'm like really good. Like if you, you? Okay. you can tell me like, I, I do this thing with my students sometimes, like they love it. They say, give me any movie ever made. And I'll tell you the year it came out. Nice. And outside of the occasional animated film. Okay. Like Over the Hedge, which I did know the other night was 2006. Okay. I knew I that it came know. out in 06. I have okay. never seen it. I know nothing about it. <laughs> I didn't know who was in it. But I knew it came out in 06. And I don't know there you why. Go. There you go. <laughs> but uh, we just made this podcast really easy because I just think to myself 72 <laughs> right yeah yeah exactly you built the podcast around around your <laughs> i don't have to drink. i don't have to think about it <laughs> but great. um so as we kind of wrap up our discussion of the movie was there anything else we wanted to talk about any other scene i'm trying to think of was there any other scene we didn't talk about definitely needed to talk about the bear <laughs> yeah honestly no i feel like we've talked about a lot of the scenes that stood out to me um mm -hmm. you know you asked before um uh, before we start about the scenes, you know, scenes we like and scenes we didn't like, yeah. it's actually hard for me to pick out scenes I didn't like. Yeah. Um, just being, you'd think as episodic as it was, maybe one would stand out right. um, mm -hmm. as not fitting. But honestly, for me, they all kind of, it's a good thing and a bad thing. They all kind of were on the same level for me. There were not huge high points and there, but there weren't huge low points. It was just kind of, an interesting mm -hmm. mildly funny watch from <laughs> from beginning to end so good enough for me to say that i liked it not good enough for me to honestly remember much uh after this film like it's not a very memorable film no it's not it's like kind of fun while you watch it but i think part of that is the episodic nature of it yeah it doesn't leave you with a lot at the end you're just yeah. like oh that was a fun interesting watch kind of an interesting film in uh, the newman career mm -hmm. But yeah, I think six months from now, like sometimes a great notion, which we talked about a year ago, has one scene in the middle that is harrowing. Hmm. Uh, Paul Newman's trying to save his brother who is stuck under a boulder and the water is coming up. Oh, geez. And he can't he can't get him out from under the boulder and the water keeps rising and rising and it's getting up to his chin and he can't save his brother. Like Jeez. they're in the middle of the forest. They're in the middle of like, nowhere and there's no one there to help. Wow. And it goes on for 10 plus minutes. And it is one of the most harrowing scenes of any movie I've talked about in this podcast. And so that's like a year, year on. That's the scene I think about when I think about like a Paul Newman movie uh, uh, that I've talked about here. I don't know if six months from now, I think I'll remember them pushing the bear on the on the swing. Uh, honestly, that's kind of the most memorable moment. <laughs> I Stacey honestly Keach. feel like I feel like, <laughs> you know, uh, I feel like in six months, I'll be like, yeah, what was the film that we talked about on the podcast? Oh, I was uh, on film at 50 last year. We talked yeah, about for, a Paul uh, Newman movie. Yeah, it was, what was it? And, well, you know, it'll take me a minute to get was, there. It uh, was the, the death, the life and death of right. uh, <laughs> Judge Russell something. <laughs> right exactly that's really like you know last time i was on was diamonds are forever bond <laughs> film uh set in vegas i live in vegas but oh yeah yeah but you know this one it's gonna be hard for me to remember much about this movie and i liked it like that's not that's not this big uh on the movie it's a it's a good movie but just not very memorable did we know exactly where this movie was set it was in the west right it was yeah. They, does it tell they you like with a does map. It tell you where it is. It, it's like on the edge of Texas. It, they they oh, open right, with right. a big it's map. Like, it's at and the edge of Texas. In. Yeah, like between Texas and New Mexico, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, kind of south. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, they did tell us. I don't remember what year it was. I think they did tell us the year, but I don't. Eighteen hundreds. Yeah, it was eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. 
but I was I was thinking to myself, wait, did they tell us where it is? Because maybe it could have been Vegas. <laughs> hey, yeah, there you go. <laughs> In the 1800s. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I think the Paul Newman performance really, like, it's, it's it's different from almost anything I've seen from him. So if you're a fan of Newman, you know, as we said before, this is available on HBO Max as of this recording. Mm-hmm. And so if it's there, if you like Paul Newman, if you like the work of John Huston, which we're going to talk about here at the end, I think it's worth a watch. I had fun with it. It was one of the better discoveries I've had for yeah. 72. There have been five to 10 I've looked at this year that I didn't know much about that were slogs where I was like an, an hour in like, okay, there's 45 minutes left. I guess I'll watch the rest since I have a guest coming on tomorrow. I should probably watch it. <laughs> and that wasn't the case here. I really, I watched yeah. it all the way through. I had a good time. Uh, it, it's kind of in the middle of the quality of the films of 72, yeah. but I, I, I liked it. I had a good time. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. So that takes us to our final two segments. Uh, the first one's called the Divine Double Feature. This ends. What would you recommend to someone that's come out in like the last twenty to twenty-five years that could be like a cool pairing with this movie? Two immediately popped in my mind. I'll, I'll give my my actual pick, and and then I'll see what you choose, and and I can I can tell you what my other one was. But um, I went with uh, at first. I was thinking of like comedic westerns. Mm. There's been a few comedic westerns, um, so that's kind of where I started, and I, I and um. I went with the ballad of Buster Scruggs. Oh, that's a good um, choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's comedic in in parts, but mm-hmm. it's episodic, right? Well, I mean, it's an anthology yeah, yeah. film, uh, so not quite episodic in the same way. But um, but yeah, I think there's plenty of goofy, twisted humor throughout Buster Scruggs. Um, they're very very different movies, but um, you know, I think I think it's kind of got this. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think Coen there's still brothers. this nature. Yeah, it's got the Coen brothers sense of humor. I think it's got this nature of waiting for the next story to appear, kind of mm. like we have in Roy Bean. Yeah. Um, some of the sequences work better than others, but there's like there's there's lots of laugh out loud moments in Buster Scruggs as well. So mm. yeah, uh so I think that would be a pretty solid um a solid double feature with Roy Bean. That's a great choice. I went with something a little bit more like harder edge. I feel like after two hours of this, you'd want something kind of maybe in this like with the same vibe of like crime and western but uh, i went with one of my favorite films the last 10 years i went with uh, hell or high water oh. which is also in the texas area and also has a you know a, a coen brothers guy and jeff bridges from mm-hmm. big lebowski and uh, true grit which would also be kind of a cool pairing too. true grit from 2010 yeah. uh but hell or high water i feel like after two hours of this and some of the comedy and the bear on the swing you'd want something if you're going to watch something modern like what like what's like a more modern kind of crime western story with really uh you know outstanding characters and performances and i saw hell or high water only once in 2016 Mm -hmm. and i still think about it six years on i still think about yeah scenes from the movie moments that shocked me the performances that was just one of those great like august wasn't it an august release it was yeah and it was just like breath of fresh air after a long summer of big event movies Hell or High Water was, just, I just remember being like so happy in the theater. I'm like, oh, Oscar season's coming. <laughs> I love Hell or High Water. Yeah. I remember because it was an August release at the time, um, going in not thinking of, that it was an Oscar movie, right? Yeah. Like this, it's like, this is not an Oscar movie. Um, <laughs> and just being blown away by the direction. I specifically remember sitting in the movie, sitting in the theater and going, the direction of this movie is so good the way yeah. action flows in that film and then for it to get all the way to the oscars was i was and then it so got happy. a best picture nomination right it got a best picture yeah. nomination jeff yeah. Bridges and jeff nominated. bridges yeah and it did it get direction i don't think it got a director nomination I don't, no it? i don't think it got director i mean that was yeah. a pretty competitive year it was yeah but that it got into picture was very exciting for especially so for an august release and it was kind yeah. of a smaller film and uh yeah. that movie Great just pick. really that, that that'd be a fun because uh, sometimes I, I sometimes I struggle with like, do I pick a second modern film that's very similar in tone sure. to the first one? Um, not to say I don't know if anyone's ever done this double feature, but I, I keep trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Uh, and yeah, I, some, so ready for something more substantial when you're when you're coming out of Roy Bean getting. Yeah, into yeah. The I mean, there was one interest. there was one episode where the movie was so deadly serious for two hours. My second film choice was Bridesmaid. <laughs> oh there you go there you go because <laughs> i'm like there's no way you could watch another movie like that <laughs> yeah yeah no that's good that's good all right so yeah those are great choices and then finally beyond the flick we have not talked about the career of john houston yet 
We yeah. talked about the career of Paul Newman last year was sometimes a great notion. Uh, John Houston, we will probably get to again. He's got some big titles coming up, like the man who would be king. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at his filmography yesterday, I was like, boy, this guy's got some great stuff. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. And so many things that you kind of forget about, or at least I do. Yeah. Like Casino Royale, the six, what is it? 69 <laughs> oh, right. version. Uh, well, I mean, he did. It, yeah. it, there's, it's a bunch of directors he, uh, who did segments. But yeah, I mean, he directed a segment of Casino Royale and um, and Annie. He directed Annie. I never remember that. I was Why? like, I saw that and I was like, you know what you could really stump film aficionados with? Like who directed 1982's Annie? Exactly. Yeah. I bet, I bet you get a lot of interesting answers. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't think you, that's not a go-to answer. John Houston directed no. Annie. Nope. Late in his career. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if you had and to it's pick a good like, movie. It's, good, yeah. it's a good, good adaptation. Yeah. yeah. So if you had to pick two or three to take with you to a desert island, John Houston, like what would be the two or three? Well, I wish I had deep cuts, um, <laughs> yeah. such as Roy Bean, but I don't. Um, so yeah, with with when you're looking at his career, what are the what are the ones you're going to take with you? I mean, you can't not choose Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I mean, it is. I did. You well. <laughs> how dare you, sir? How dare you, sir? Uh, but it's fourth. I, fourth. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, I I I think that movie. No, it's still great. however you know whatever we are 80 years later is just so thrilling like mm -hmm. it is so exciting um kind of the insanity that creeps into the guys is is still so like palpable and and uh, at times scary and exciting like i i think that movie is i mean this is uh, the the most basic opinion so it's not like i'm telling somebody some deep hot take that that movie is good but uh but really i mean it just holds up if you haven't watched it, i know some people well i don't know if they'd be listening to this podcast but some people are hesitant with older films mm -hmm. <laughs> it feels so it just feels so modern even though it's from the 40s i mean mm -hmm. it's, it's a thrilling film so that's number one mm -hmm. um the second one i already mentioned earlier the african queen mm -hmm. maybe that's not quite as uh it's i mean it's not a deep cut but um so uh good. It's so good. It's such a fun, sweet, charming adventure. Um, you know, I love uh, it's. I love that he's using these aging stars. I say aging because yeah, aging, it's a few they're like forty five or something. exactly. I mean, it's a, it's only a few years before Humphrey Bogart dies, but I mean, yeah. Catherine Hepburn still has like thirty year, forty year, more years in her career. But yeah. um, long time. But it's it's just so good. It's such a sweet adventure um a, it's similar to what i was saying earlier kind of this blend of old hollywood and kind of new exciting directions yeah so african queen is one of my favorites and then like we all already said the maltese falcon mm -hmm. you know it, it's a classic for a reason so many movies it, it had tried to replicate what maltese falcon mm -hmm. did and yeah so it's it's phenomenal yeah those are three awesome choices yeah I, I think of the african queen it's like i love when two huge movie stars make one movie together and they're just perfectly suited to those characters. And yeah. but the, you don't see them in 17 other films. Yet. There's, there's just that one. I yep. think about Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> uh, who would I mean, she worked with some actors a lot like Cary Grant. She worked with, mm -hmm. I want to say, three times. And and then obviously Spencer, Spencer Tracy, Tracy. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, I love her pairing with Humphrey Bogart in the uh, African Queen. And I love her her pairing with Henry Fonda in on golden pond yep. at the end of their careers two huge stars who got their starts in the 30s mm -hmm. and they never made a movie together yeah until the last film that henry fonda makes right before he dies mm -hmm. and they are so wonderful together in on golden pond it's one of those like mini miracle movies like that was able to happen before he died and you know stay on film forever yeah and i think yeah i think that's a great choice african queen that's in my top three as well along with the maltese falcon uh, I, I just, I love the misfits from 61. I've never seen it. It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a uh, Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe. It's both of their last movies. Uh, mm. and it's set in Reno where I live when it's like, like probably the greatest film ever made that's set in Reno and it's got kind of a Western vibe, but it's 61. So we're starting to kind of push into a little bit of new Hollywood area. It takes more risk. It's a little bit more sexual, a little bit mm -hmm. more violent, and it's a little bit more abstract than your like typical like Western of the 50s. 
Uh, but it's got great character work and the best performances I think I've seen at least late stage Clark Gable. It's like one of his better roles. And it's the best I've ever seen Marilyn Monroe. She's very just much alive and free. And she's not just the bombshell sex symbol. Yeah. I just watched Blonde last night, by the way. <laughs> yeah, what did you think? Where it was so weird because I was very excited about it. I love Anna de Armas. Yeah. And I love stories about Hollywood. And then the last two weeks, every time I go on Twitter, it's not just it's horrible that everyone's like, don't watch it. It's not yeah. worth watching. And I'm like, whoa, what? And so I can kind of see the way the the way the story treats Marilyn Monroe in a lot of scenes is kind of shocking and yeah. hard to take. And, you know, this is a, this is, I mean, I haven't read a biography about her, but from the little things I've seen and read, it sounds like she had a very, very difficult life at times. And so it's like, okay, a three hour movie about just like punishing her in so many different ways. Yeah. But like, technically it's very good and yeah. she's great. Like her, like scene to scene, she is just bringing it and she yeah, is like I on a, on a another level of anything I've seen from her, but almost kind of like Roy Bean. I wasn't meaning to compare the two. It's a uh, blonde is very episodic. Absolutely. And it yeah. never finds a rhythm ever. Yeah. And if you're going to make a three hour movie, you need to find some kind of a rhythm. I mean, the Godfather's episodic, but it finds a rhythm and you can kind of feel, like kind of see where it's going next. And Blonde, like the director will just jump from here to here and back to here. And you're like, this is black and white. This is color. And sometimes it feels like it's more style over substance. And at the end, I was just like, ultimately, I think it's worth watching. There's a lot of good stuff in it, but it's just kind of a cold enterprise. It doesn't really leave you with anything. And yeah, that's I where that, that was what I, that was the negative energy I took away from it. It's very impressionistic, which I think works. Uh, sometimes I agree. The crafts are phenomenal, and mm-hmm. Anadarmus is great. The but, score um, is great. Gore the is score, beautiful. I would like download it right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but I think it's just not. Uh, the story isn't cohesive enough and, and not truthful enough, so that it. Yeah. I feel like it's trying to tell us about her life, but it's a fictionalized version of it. So it just becomes this mishmash of what's impressionistic of how her life went versus what actually happened it's very i don't know it's it was a little all over the place but at the same time it's very linear in telling the story of her film roles like it'll be like oh when okay here's when she's in all about eve in 1950 and she's watching it and then we get like really fantastic recreations of some of her film roles that one that that where the camera pushes in on her from some like it hot she looks like marilyn monroe i thought the same thing like it's the like same thing disturbingly like yeah. this looks like it's her and yeah. so when she storms off the set screaming at billy wilder i'm like this is really fantastic the yeah. recreation here and so it goes in like linear order of like her like her career over the 50s but then it's kind of bouncing around in her personal life and a lot of it just it, it seems cruel to her a very and i'm yeah. like but what's the purpose here we don't really get into her psyche it's kind of like all surfacey we don't really get a, an emotional sense to her and i don't Agreed. know it was, there was something lacking there like yeah. i needed to get more of like a, an insight into her and it feels like it's just all on the surface i don't know agree agree but i do think yeah. it's worth a look i don't think it's yeah. like don't watch this <laughs> yeah yeah i think people like, i've seen worse in I, 2022 I <laughs> yeah I, I think people's reactions are emotion driven rather than yeah. based on the actual film i, I don't know i don't want to i don't want to tell people how to feel but yeah um yeah I, I, it's it's not as bad as i thought it was gonna be uh i wouldn't say it's great either though. but i feel of, like yeah. the level of craft in it is at a is at a point where it's like i i can't i, I can't say don't watch it because yeah. there's a lot of junk that comes out every year exactly that is not worth your time in any way so it's yeah, like totally even totally. if it i'm all for ambitious failures right you know, it's yeah. okay <laughs> like yeah. if, if yeah. it doesn't work that's okay the question is does anna de armas get any nominations next year that I, i'm is like, really torn because it's she's playing Marilyn Monroe. It's you know that got Michelle Williams an Oscar nomination exactly. eleven years ago, and she's really good in it. Like if it's just mm-hmm. based on just her performance, scene to scene for three hours, she's in the whole movie outside of the, the opening thi- prologue. The thing though is, uh, it's very comparable to Kristen Stewart last year, right? Yeah. An impressionistic the, biopic. Yeah. The thing is, movie I think Spencer. 
Right, yes, but even Spencer, I think, was easier to watch than yeah. Blonde, right. uh, shorter. So, um, you know, I feel like I yeah. feel like will the Academy like if if you're just looking on paper on Adarmas, cool, she's a rising star, you know, all this stuff we like on Adarmas, and she's playing Marilyn Monroe. Okay, I'll check the box, but will they sit through the movie? I, I don't, I don't know. When it comes to screener season, is that are they going to finish it? I don't know, you know. Yeah, no, that's true. I just think, I mean, she's still young, but I mean, she's done great work in like Knives Out and some of these films. And like, this is like a big performance 100%. that I feel like is hard to ignore. I feel like the movie opening in September on Netflix is not a good sign. I agree might be that. by December, January, we might be on to five other films that just have better chances. And I think Best Actress is looking very competitive. It's very competitive. That's but the I, thing. I was I was really impressed with just her performance outside of everything else. That I was like, I wouldn't count her out yet. I know. I'm. I'm I keep <laughs> going like this on her chances. I'm back and forth because Best Actress is very crowded. But on the other hand, Netflix. I'm I'm going off the top of my head, so I could be forgetting something. Uh, they don't have a lot of top tier contenders this year. Okay. Like. I feel I feel like Bardo is like their big Bardo, which didn't trying to, do well at the festivals. Exactly, got a new cut which people are responding well to. Apparently, okay. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, but um, There's but yeah, a, a, a lot of yeah, exactly. <laughs> but a lot of people are so that's why I'm, I'm wondering if Netflix will have the bandwidth. It se- seems like they might have the bandwidth to really make On Armas happen. Yeah, or maybe not. I don't know. I think the reaction is such a way that I think what they would do in November December is just do a full push just for her. Nothing exactly. Else. Exactly. Like just just get the nomination for her. Yep. The same way that Stewart got a nomination for Spencer. Yep. I could see it happening. I mean, I I I, I want to see how the season plays out, and uh, if we get to January and there's like twelve great performances yeah. by lead actresses and with five better slots, movies, with better movies that are better reviews. I yeah. mean, I haven't looked at Rotten Tomatoes for Blonde. Is it is it fresh? I don't even know. Uh, no, it's not, it's not fresh. I, I want to so, say it's like 38 or something. Yeah, I think I think a September release on Netflix if it's if it's rotten, I just uh, and she's it's not like she has like 10 credits before. Kind of like I mean after Twilight, really Kristen Stewart spent years just doing really great kind of under the radar dramatic performances. A lot like she won some critics prizes. Yeah. He won some big awards like uh, overseas, like her cred was really building over like seven years before she got to Spencer. Anna de Armas, I don't know if she's at the level of Kristen Stewart is now yeah. that she could just kind of slide in there. And the other thing so. is cr- uh, critics really helped push Kristen Spencer. Stewart um, yeah. and Spencer. So um, Blonde is, I'm guessing, yeah, Blonde's at a 43%. Around 43, tomatoes, okay. Which you can get nominated with that, that <laughs> yeah. lowest score, but you really have to push for that so i i yeah i'm leaning towards no but I, i'm not gonna nothing. rule it out because the, I, there's a world where she gets nominated like i don't want to say oh that's never gonna happen no it could i'm leaning towards a no though. i mean i think there's 20 plus scenes in blonde that you could use as her oscar clip exactly like there's 20 tons. yeah 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 there's tons <laughs> is there a scene where she's not crying in the movie <laughs> right, i don't right. think there is <laughs> like at yeah. some point even if it's a longer scene like a tear comes down yeah, exactly. So she's like, she's going for it. It's yeah. not just like a, like a, you know. So, oh. and when it's when it's Marilyn Monroe, but uh, yeah, if you if you like Marilyn Monroe's work, if you've seen some like it hot and some of her big big uh, comedy films, uh, I would recommend The Misfits. It's it's not a comedy. It's very serious and uh, it's a, it's like a kind of a cool like western of the early sixties that's pushing the genre forward, and it's. One of the best movies ever set in Reno. So that's kind of cool. I actually nice. shot it here too in 1960. So that's kind of a cool story. I love about it. And then <laughs> the other ones are Key Largo is a mm. terrific film noir. Maybe my favorite film that Paris Humphrey Bogart with Lauren Bacall. Like they're very famous for The Big Sleep and yeah. The Have and Have Not. But Key Largo really uses that setting to a terrific degree. I love that movie. And then I mentioned before The Manny Would Be King wise blood and then pritzy's honor from 85 is a great jack nicholson vehicle terrific uh angelica houston performance that won her the oscar yeah. and w- w- was that was that the first trio because i think john houston's father also won an oscar like it was the first time like where three generations of a family yeah you're probably right won an oscar so that yeah. was cool <laughs> yeah so yeah john houston one of the greats uh directed films from 41 to 87 
and is also a prolific was also a prolific actor too he was mm-hmm. in a lot he's famously in chinatown yep, yep. so he's uh, also a terrific actor and was happy to see him show up in judge roy bean grizzly adams, grizzly adams. <laughs> all right that takes us to the end here daniel thanks for being my guest again on film at 50 i'd love for you to t- talk about where our listeners can find you online and anything you want to promote now would be the time yeah, absolutely. You can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active uh, at Howitt, D-K, H-O-W-A-T-D-K. Um, and you can find my writing and podcasting at Next Best Picture. Obviously, we're diving into the awards race. <laughs> uh, so lots of good time, lots of good content coming your way. Uh, a lot of interviews and, and all sorts of things, predictions. So you can find it over at Next Best Picture. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for being here, Daniel. Thanks to all of you for listening. You can find us online at film at 50 dot dot com we're on facebook twitter and instagram check out my youtube channel brian Rowe video for videos about oscar history and oscar predictions <laughs> moving forward into the new season mm-hmm. and until next time remember 50 never looked this good <laughs>